There's a server on my desk you guys have not seen before. And in a surprise twist on this channel, this one is brand new. Join me as I dive into Intel's all-new Ice Lake CPUs and provide a glimpse of what my home lab might look like in another six years. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff, and today's video is brought to you by Shaker and Spoon. More about them at the end of the video. On the desk in front of me is one of the first servers from Supermicro to feature Intel's all-new third-generation Xeon scalable processors. Previously codenamed Ice Lake, now known simply as Sunny Cove, these new chips are the first Xeons to use Intel's 10 nanometer lithography. But before we get into today's review, I do want to send a huge thanks over to Supermicro for sending this over for me to take a look at. Just like all reviews on this channel, no money has changed hands, Supermicro has no influence over the content of this video, and I'm pretty sure the return label on this box means they're going to ask me to send it back at some point. We'll see how that goes. In the world of data centers and servers, there's usually not much evolution in aesthetics. And don't misunderstand me there, that is not a complaint. When a design works, you stick with it. And there is not much to tell apart the all-new Supermicro 620p TRT from many of its predecessors. But rest assured, it is all new inside. To start off, Sony Cove Xeons are on an all-new socket, moving from LGA 3647 to LGA 4189. The new socket was needed this time around due to the increase in memory channels, improving to a full 8 channels per socket compared to just 6 on 2nd gen Xeons. This also includes a much higher power ceiling of 270 watts, again up from 205 watts of the previous generation. Taking a tour of the server, you'll find Supermicro's X12 DPI NT6 motherboard and a pair of 4189 sockets, both of them filled with Intel Xeon Gold 6330 CPUs. That's 28 cores per CPU for a total of 56 cores and 112 threads at your disposal. The CPUs are flanked by a rather odd layout of 18 DIMM slots. With each CPU wired up with 8 channels of memory for a total of 16, what are the two extra slots used for? Great question, I'm glad you asked. Those are reserved for Intel Optane persistent memory DIMMs. While the technology originally launched with second generation Xeons, known as Persistent Memory Modules, or PMM for short, Sunny Cove introduces a new series of Optane 200 DIMMs, or PMM 200 because Intel is just as consistent as Microsoft when it comes to shorthand acronyms across generations of products. Putting persistent memory closer to the CPUs allows for lower latency and faster speeds, even when compared to the best M.2 and U.2 NVMe solutions that are currently available. Installed into a DDR4 memory slot alongside traditional system memory, you're now able to install up to 2 terabytes per CPU socket of PMEM DIMMs, with read speeds exceeding 7 gigabytes per second per each module. With Optane DIMMs being available in up to 512 gigabytes per module, you could easily install 4 terabytes of Optane storage with 1 terabyte of total system memory on this server. So if you've been looking for a server with lightning fast read and write cache potential, Ice Lake certainly looks like it could be an option for you. This particular server came with only 512 gigabytes of DDR4 registered ECC memory running at 3200 MTS, spread out across all 16 channels available and I, for one, am pretty darn excited to see what kind of memory bandwidth we'll get once we start testing. Keeping the Xeon CPUs cool are a set of passive heat sinks with a couple heat pipes inside. While they are not the beefiest coolers I have ever seen in a 2U chassis, they do a remarkably good job of keeping the 6330s cool. Under a Cinebench R23 stress test, the CPUs peaked at just 52 degrees Celsius here in my office. Of course, in servers, coolers are never actually passive. The fans are just further away than you might be used to, as is the case with the three 90mm fans throwing air through the internals of this case. Each of these blowing matrons can draw up to 29 watts each, so that's 90 watts of draw just from the fans, or, you know, more power than the majority of desktop CPUs. Taking a look at expansion in the 620p, we'll find four PCI Express 4.0 x16 slots and a pair of x8 slots, all of which are low profile. As the server is designed primarily for file server and data center virtualization, there's not a lot of need for full height or GPU support. Instead, you can load up on even more flash storage or high-speed I.O., like this 7-year-old Sun F80 cache card or this 8-year-old dual 40 gigabit network card. I mean, I guess you could equip this with more modern I.O., but... You get the idea. While for most use cases, low profile is just fine, I would definitely prefer to see at least one full size slot available. Supermicro does have other 2U servers available with this configuration though, if that is a make or break feature for you. 
Other internal connectivity includes a single M.2 22110 port for an NVMe drive, and up to four additional NVMe drives via the JNVMe ports found at the front of the motherboard. Storage-wise, the 620p has a total of eight 3.5-inch drive trays included, as well as an 8-port SAS backplane. However, the onboard interface appears to be SATA only on the motherboard, potentially limiting your drive options. The included cables are a pair of mini SAS 8087s, which break into four SATA connections each before plugging into the backplane. While it is a bit disappointing not to find SAS connectivity here, it's not like high-capacity SATA disks aren't available. For example, I currently have the server filled with eight 12 terabyte SATA disks from Arsenal, and on speed testing, these maxed out at around 250 megabytes per second read and write, which is still well below the 6 gigabit per second connection of SATA 3 ports. Now again, Supermicro is a company that doesn't like to change things if they're still working, and in the end, it's the customers who win. This drive tray, for example, is the same one that's used in my Supermicro 846 NAS server, and that's a box that debuted all the way back in 2008. Supermicro is entering its 14th year of drive tray compatibility. Meanwhile, the likes of HPE, Dell, and Cisco will change drive trays every couple of years and don't even include a full complement of drive trays when you buy a server. Instead, they like to include blanks to cover up the hole where a hard drive could go. Likewise, on the power supplies, the 620p includes a pair of 800 watt 80 plus titanium rated units that are hot swappable. But this is not the unit from the 620p. In fact, this is from my own Supermicro 846 NAS, and it uses the exact same power supplies, which again means that Supermicro has about 14 years of compatibility going for them. If something ever goes wrong, not only is Supermicro still making parts for my 14-year-old server, those same parts have been used in nearly every single server they produce over the last 14 years, making both new and used replacements easy to find. Around the rear of this server, we'll find a very basic assortment of ports. VGA for video, four USB ports, an RS-232 serial, dual 10 gigabit ethernet on an Intel X550 chipset, and a dedicated IPMI for remote management. And on the front, we've got another pair of USBs plus a second RS-232 serial. And I think that might be the longest spec list I've ever read off at the beginning of a video. So with all that power under the hood, what exactly can you do with this server? I'm actually right at home with systems like this, as I deployed similar boxes for about 10 years. Again, while GPU compute and AI is for the most part off the table here, 2U storage servers with high core counts make amazing general purpose boxes for small and medium sized businesses. As mentioned, the Supermicro 620p came shipped to me with dual Xeon 6330 28 core CPUs and 512 gigabytes of DDR4 registered ECC memory. I've gone ahead and kitted it out with what I would think would be a very common set of hardware for a medium sized business. It's got eight 12 terabyte hard drives, an 800 gigabyte M.2 NVMe for a boot disk, the Sun F80 cache card to serve as a deduplication VDEV, a 2.6 terabyte Fusion IO drive for storage cache, and dual 40 gigabit networking. With a setup like this, you could run your entire network storage server, any virtual machines needed for internal applications or services, like Active Directory, WSS, or WDS for client management, or any internal or external web applications you might need. You could set up a virtualized firewall, mail server. Boxes like this are so incredibly versatile, the possibilities are pretty much endless. With that very long introduction out of the way, let's talk about what I like about the server, what I don't like about it, and if it's worth considering for your business deployments. As I mentioned earlier in the video, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The chassis design, rail system, drive mounts, power supplies, all being essentially the same design for so long, means that parts will always be available and easy to find in the future. I've worked on other servers that seemingly change part compatibility between generations because they wanted hard drive lights to be in a different location, or the front bezel needed to be changed, or if you're like HP, you wanted a custom chip to spin an Xbox 360 style light that would indicate drive activity, but also display warnings on your server if your drive tray wasn't OEM hardware. In reality, the goal was to force you to buy drives directly from HP. Now, Dell and HP servers also don't include any extra drive trays if they weren't populated at the time of purchase. This has the side effect of keeping drive tray prices high on the secondary market, making unsanctioned upgrades even more difficult years after the server has gone out of production. Do you want to add drives to the Supermicro 620p? Pull out one of the included drive trays, put your hard drive of choice in it, and put it back in the server. It's as simple as that. Moving on to the internals, the layout is very clean and easy to work on. Nearly every part of the server is available to remove without needing to disassemble anything else first. 
First order of retrievability means that in the event of a hardware issue, repair is both faster and easier than disassembling half the server to get to the part that you need. There are a couple small gripes I have about the included hardware, namely around storage. First, while an M.2 slot is pretty much a given in any modern PC hardware, I would have liked to see at least two slots on this motherboard. For critical servers, I always run mirrored drives for an operating system to help prevent downtime, and only having a single M.2 is a bit of a bummer, especially given the lack of 2.5-inch drive bays. That is a pretty minor complaint, as Supermicro does sell a low-profile M.2 to PCI Express card to allow multiple internal drives, but it would have been nice to see that as an option without taking up a PCIe slot. Secondly, the use of SATA-only connections on the 3.5-inch drive bays does feel a little limiting. Not that you're going to run into bandwidth limitations on 6 gigabit per second SATA connections with spinning disks, but enterprise drives more often than not only come with 12 gigabit per second SAS connections. Again, this isn't exactly a deal breaker as there are plenty of SATA options available, like the 12 terabyte spinning disks I used here, but it is something to keep in mind when choosing both the server and the storage to go with it. While the onboard Intel controller does only support SATA hard drives, it does feature both HBA and RAID modes from the BIOS. So whether you're planning on running a software-based array in something like TrueNAS or Unraid, or need to go with a more low-level hardware approach for Windows, you'll have both options available without needing to invest in a separate controller card. As for the rest of the storage, I did find something that, while again, not deal-breaking for most people, might sway some high-speed storage users onto a slightly more epic platform with unified NUMA nodes. Remember, because this is a dual socket server, the PCI resources are wired either to one CPU or the other, potentially creating NUMA-related latency issues depending on your use case. In the case of NVMe storage in this server, all five slots, that is the single M.2 plus both of the JNVMe ports, are all wired up to CPU1. The same goes for the Intel X550 10 gigabit LAN controller as well. In fact, CPU2 doesn't have much connected to it at all. Just PCI Express ports 4 through 6 are on the back, plus the required chipset related lanes. So most of the I.O. in the server flows through CPU 1. Again, this is not that big of a deal, nor entirely uncommon in servers, but it does demonstrate one of the weaknesses inherent in dual socket systems. AMD Epic dual socket boards suffer from the exact same shortcomings, though they also have double the PCIe lanes per CPU, as well as 64 cores per chip versus a max of 40 cores per chip on Ice Lake. Though, to Intel's credit, they do offer Optane PMM200 modules for top flight storage, which is a technology that Team Red does not have a competing product for yet. And last but certainly not least, let's talk about management and the included BMC port. I did run into a little bit of a weird issue where I was able to log into the management console, but none of the information actually loaded into the screen, nor was I able to navigate between pages. This happened on both Chrome and Firefox inside Windows, but may have just been an anomaly. I was able to log in without issue later on using Safari in macOS. Everything you'd expect to see on a management console seems to be there and is very well presented in HTML5. Core system stats like firmware versions, MAC addresses, current power state, and power usage are all there on the main page, with more detailed information available in tabs on the top and left sides. The left is a full menu of options, while the bar along the top has a couple fast access buttons for specific locations, like sensor readings and UID light control. There's also a BIOS level remote control, allowing you to view and configure the server before boot up. Like I said, all in all, pretty much everything I could want in an IPMI solution. The Supermicro Mainstream Sys620P, configured with the X12 DPI NT6 motherboard and dual Intel Gold 6330 Xeon CPUs, is definitely an impressive bit of kit. Aside from a couple niche limitations around NVMe and NUMA nodes, as well as the lack of any full-size PCIe expansion, it's hard to be disappointed at the feature set on display here. A server like this would make for an absolute workhorse as a single server data center or as part of a larger deployment. Configurable with up to 80 CPU cores, 128 PCI Express 4.0 lanes, 8 3.5 inch hard drive trays, and a solid layout of onboard features, it's a server that can handle just about anything a small to medium sized business could throw at it. If you're interested in taking a look at the Supermicro 620p, I will have a link down to Supermicro's website in the video description where you could possibly configure your own. I'll also have affiliate links for other hardware I showed off in this video, like the 12TB Arsenal SATA drives I picked up on Amazon for just $189. If you've been wondering what I've been drinking during this episode, this is a delicious baklava sour courtesy of today's video sponsor, Shaker and Spoon. Now, this may be primarily a beer channel, but make no mistake, cocktails were my first love. 
And as much as I try to keep a well-stocked bar here in the studio, tracking down fresh ingredients can be a bit of a chore, especially when the four closest liquor stores to me don't even know what cardamom bitters are, let alone keep them in stock. And it's not like I've been busy with more important things lately. That is where Shaker and Spoon comes in. Instead of needing to spend tens or even hundreds of dollars just to try out a new drink recipe, they send you a box based around a single spirit and enough ingredients to mix up 12 cocktails. Here on the table is their Rum's the Word pack. I supply the aged rum and ice, Shaker and Spoon sends out the recipes for three drinks and enough supplies to make four of each, like the Hemingway and Nika, a grapefruit syrup and lime affair with pimento bitters. But anyone who knows me knows I am a sucker for a good rye drink, so the All Eyes on Rye box was pretty much calling my name. And as much as I love a good old-fashioned, or a coffee-infused maple and vanilla sling, I was actually more drawn to the baklava sour, particularly because it uses an egg white, and it's fun watching people get squeamish when I crack an egg into my shaker. After that, it's two ounces of rye whiskey, three-quarter ounce lemon juice, three-quarter ounce baklava syrup, and two dashes of cardamom bitters. Give that a dry shake to emulsify the egg into a nice meringue foam, then add ice and shake again. And finally, strain into a coupe. Shaker and Spoon is a monthly subscription, delivering a spirit-themed box straight to your door each month. Get yourself into the craft cocktail game without running all over town. Go to shakerandspoon.com slash craft to sign up and get $20 off your first box. That's shakerandspoon.com slash craft, and a huge thanks to them for sponsoring today's video. And that is going to do it for me in today's video. If you like this one, make sure to hit that thumbs up button. There's also the thumbs down button, although no one knows if you actually clicked that one anymore. And subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining me on Patreon. Link is down in the video description. Thank you all so much for watching this one. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. That is fantastic. All right, so the drink I chose to make today is the Baklava Sour, which kind of caught my eye because it has raw egg whites in it, which usually turns most people off, but that just makes me very curious. I am a huge fan of whiskey sours and amaretto sours, specifically made Boston style with an egg white shaken into it. So we get this nice, light, fluffy head on top of the drink that gives it a real creaminess all the way through. Here we go. But I will say, the two dashes of cardamom is definitely all you need in this drink. Uh, that cardamom really carries the entire profile of this, but it's playing so well off of that lemon in there. I don't think I've ever had a, a lemon cocktail, lemon based cocktail with cardamom bitters in it before. I don't know why, I just haven't. Interestingly enough, the rye kind of takes a back seat in this cocktail. Uh, like I said, it's really carried by that cardamom bitter. Uh, notes of like elderflower and honey is what I want to say. Uh, it's a much softer drink. It's not, it's not bitey like you would think of a rye, and it's not bitey the way you would think of a sour. Uh, it actually kind of blends together for a pretty light on your tongue, velvety light kind of cocktail. I'm a fan.